Hello and welcome to week one, part three, hardware versus software. So let's start with a fundamental question. What is a computer? That is kind of what we're going to talk about in this video. We're going to discuss what a computer is, what is hardware, what is software, what is the difference between the two, and then we're going to try to understand these concepts a bit more deeper, go into some essential parts of each to see how they all work together. So uh, let's get started and just dive in. So what is a computer? And a technical term then could be an electronic device capable of processing and storing data according to instructions. So a computer consists of hardware and software that works together. And there are different types of computers, of course. Now, what you're thinking of is probably screen, uh, some type of um, um, tower with components in it or a laptop or, or a tablet, but your phone is actually a computer. Um, I have a smartwatch, that is a computer. If you have a smart TV, that is a computer. And a computer could even be a tiny, like this big microchip inside something else. That is technically a computer. It still uh, has electrical charges and it still computes and stores data. So thinking of a computer isn't just as simple as it's the thing I game on. Uh, it can be many different things. So the key factor here about computers in general is that it's a general purpose hardware that you can change according to your own needs using instructions. So think of a non-general piece of hardware. I usually use the um, example of a calculator. A calculator can do math. It, it can't show you an image, it can't show you a, a video, you can't game on it. Um, but you can, if you have a computer, uh, use a calculator, play a video game, you can listen to music, you can, you can do, do word processing, uh, graphical work, anything you want based on the instructions for that. So. That is really what makes com computers so powerful, that we don't need separate hardware to perform specific tasks. Um, and this allows us to change what we need them to do, and that is through coding, really. So if the general purpose hardware can be changed according to instructions, What's so special about that? So before we had machines doing specific tasks and machines take time and money, effort to learn. And computers are so incredibly powerful because you just need one thing and you can change it. I know I'm repeating myself, but the idea of programmability is the thing that revolutionized technology and made the computer so incredibly essential and influential uh, in our society. So it is something that is important to understand as why are they so useful? Why did they become so widely uh, adopted? And why do we rely on them so much today? So if a computer consists of hardware and software, let's try to differentiate between the terms and understand them a bit more. So what is hardware? Hardware is everything you can physically touch and pick up when it comes to computer science. It's a mouse, a screen, um, uh, a game controller, um, the, uh, the graphics card, everything. Or as I like to joke when I'm uh, trying to explain this, it's everything you can throw out of a window when you're frustrated that it's not working. So what's software then? 
The software are the instructions. That's the code that runs on the hardware. Without the software, the hardware is just a piece of metal and plastic, really. And the code needs something to work on. The code changes the electrical current in the hardware. It turns small, small switches on and off. That is what a computer does, really. So neither can exist without the other. Without the software, the hardware is just a piece of junk. And without the hardware, the software has nothing to change, really. So they work together. When I started being interested in computer science and I looked into computers when I was trying to buy a new one, I was really confused by all the specifications, what it all meant, what they all did, and really had no idea what any of it was. So in designing this course, I um, used that as my basis to explain hardware because I felt that that is a good level to start at, especially if you're buying a new computer Looking, looking at the specifications and understanding what they mean is going to give you some confidence and it's going to give you a good baseline to start with. So let's start with the term processor. What is a processor? A processor is a physical component that processes data. Now, it's a general term. It doesn't apply to just one thing. It's anything that processes data. And it could apply to the CPU, the central processing unit, or the GPU that processes graphics. But in when somebody says processor, it's just something that processes data and you don't really know what it does until you have some more information. So if we start with the CPU, what is the CPU? Well, it stands for that central processing unit. And a programming uh, pal of mine, a programmer pal of mine said, just please, for the love of God, don't say that it's the brain of the computer. But it is, it is the brain of the computer. It is the, uh, the part, the physical unit of the computer that does uh, arithmetic, that does the processes that calculates the instructions. The CPU is a central unit, so it is essentially um, a place to where you have cores. So the CPU itself manages the cores and tells them what instructions to perform and coordinates with the rest of the computer. The CPU itself doesn't execute anything, doesn't calculate anything. It is the one that tells the cores what to do and in what order and then communicates with the rest of the hardware. So then what are cores? So modern computers have one or more cores, usually more, and they are the ones that actually do the, the processing, the arithmetics, uh, the, the executing instructions, etc. So if the CPU manages the cores, what are the cores? Well, the cores consist of millions of really tiny transistors. And what these do is they act as switches and they turn on and off electrical paths. So that is what a computer does. So the CPU tells the core, turn this switch on, turn this switch off. And that enables the computer to execute and run code and do all the processes and everything it needs to do. Since modern computers have more than one core, that means that computers can do more than one task at once. So all of these cores have their own individual tasks, they can work together, and the CPU itself contains all the cores, manages all of them, and tells them what to do, and communicates with the rest of the hardware. So what is the GPU and the graphics card? Well, the card itself contains the GPU. Usually people use them interchangeably, but they're not really the same thing. So the graphics card itself usually comes as something you can exchange in your computer. You can upgrade it or you can switch it out if it gets damaged. Um, the graphics card itself has houses the GPU. 
So the GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit. It is a piece of hardware that is optimized and specialized to render images, to create images. So it's made for graphical tasks. It's what makes you be, uh, makes it possible to watch a movie, play a video game, work with graphics on your computer. So how is it really different from the CPU? So the CPU is the brain and does all the calculations processes. And the GPU really focuses on rendering images. So it gets a bunch of information and processes this to create images, then sends that data as pixels to your screen so that you can view them. So the next hardware that's good to know is a hard drive. So what is a hard drive and what types are there? So you have a hard to disk drive, hard drive, HDD, SSD, all of these, all of them are hard drives. So a hard drive stores data long-term. That means that even when you turn off your computer, you have that data safe. It doesn't need power to save the data. Now there are lots of different types. You have the HDD and the SDD, that is SSD, sorry, SSD, that is uh, the most common today. We used to have hard disk drives, HDD, and now we have SSD drives usually. HDDs, they are mechanical and physical. So they're spinning discs and you have these tiny arms like on a, on a record player that physically writes information and stores data on them. So they can break down and um, over time a lot faster than modern uh, drives. Because of the mechanical nature of HDDs, they, they, they get ruined a lot faster, they break down, and they're much more vulnerable to, to shocks, to temperature, to environmental changes, and they're not very fast or very stable. So instead, we nowadays use SSD drives. So SSD drives use uh, technology that's similar to a USB flash drive, a thumb drive really. Um, instead of being mechanical and using spinning disks and writing to something like HDD, they store data electronically using something called memory cells. Um, basically, since they're digital, they don't break down as fast as HDDs. They are more stable, they're faster. Um, and they're more resistant to environmental changes, they're just more durable, um, and generally they are preferable for most people. The only time really HDD drives or HD drives are preferable is if you have really large quantities of data that you want to store long term. So you don't write to it often, you don't save stuff often on it, you just want to store it somewhere. For most people, SSDs are much, much better, faster, more reliable, and just is going to work much better for everyday needs. Much like flash drives, SSDs have, don't have any mechanical parts, no moving parts, and that's why they're able to um, sustain over such a long time. Uh, if you're looking for a computer that you're going to be using a lot and you're going to uh, save and delete and really want it to be fast, look for one with an SSD drive. So what is a motherboard? Now I'm sure we've all heard this term. For me personally this was a mystery for a long time. But essentially it's a central platform for all of your other hardware. So what does that really mean? I want to explain it and I think it's easiest to understand it with a little bit of a metaphor. So imagine when you're building Legos, you sometimes have this like floor or a plate where you stick on your Lego pieces. So that is the thing that houses all the other pieces of Lego, the floor. That is the motherboard. So if you have a contained little Lego plate like this and you slot on Lego piece like that, 
this is the hard drive you slot it onto the motherboard so this is where you can change out your graphics uh, card and, and, and your GPU, for example. This is where you can change out your, your hard drive if you want to. Um, this is the thing that connects all of the other hardware together. So it doesn't just do that physically, but it is also uh, digitally that thing that coordinates all of the hardware and makes sure that it talks to each other and works together. So the motherboard does have some code and the code that works on there is called firmware. Now you are going to probably have to go into BIOS to do some stuff during your education. So when you go into BIOS, that is the firmware and that is when you start affecting the motherboard. So what is RAM? If your hard drive is what stores memory long-term, RAM is your short-term memory. When you store stuff on your hard drive, you turn off your computer and you still have everything saved. When you store something in RAM and you turn off your computer, it's all gone. So it is your computer's short-term memory. So what is this good for really? Well, it is a place where the CPU can store data that it needs to access really fast in order to do uh, what it needs to do. It manages to uh, keep the system going in the background and also allows you to do whatever you're doing and has, stores the ac uh, data for the stuff you're doing uh, so you can use that quickly as well. So think when you're on your phone and you're copying um, a word onto your clipboard. The RAM of a computer is sort of like the clipboard. It's a space to store things and you can access them fast and easy. So since this is the short-term memory, every time you start a program or your browser or something, um, the necessary instructions and the necessary data to use that while you're using it is loaded into the RAM. And that is where the CPU access that data and uh, works. So the CPU uses the RAM to process that info, to, to, to work uh, with whatever you're doing and the system. So when you have a lot of stuff open, it uses a lot of RAM and that's when your computer starts going a bit slower or it starts to freeze up or a program stops working suddenly. So this can happen a lot if you work with graphical programs and you have too much stuff open at once. You try to save something and it might say, can not save this, not enough RAM. That is that the memory of the RAM, the workspace, it doesn't have more uh, processing power. It doesn't have more storage for the CPU to do what it needs to do. So something needs to just shut down so that the CPU can continue working and so that you can continue with the other things you were doing, for example. So it's volatile. Uh, anything that you store in the RAM gets gone as soon as the computer, as, as soon as the power turns off. So that is the essentials of a computer. Now let's go through some stuff that is important and necessary for networking, or in other words, go online. So you have uh, the NIC or network interface card to start with, or as it's sometimes called network adapter. So this piece of hardware, the network interface card, um, what it does is it converts the data you have on your computer into a format that is, a, that is possible to transmit over a network. So these cards contain something called connectors. And this is where you can attach either ethernet cables or uh, wireless antennas. This is the thing that remakes the data so that it can be sent. And then you plug in something that actually sends the data on towards the network. So some of these NICs are integrated into your computer. Sometimes you need to buy one separately. 
sometimes it's already there and sometimes it contains both a network interface card and a wireless adapter. So a wireless adapter is essentially the same thing as a network interface card, but it allows you to connect to Wi-Fi directly. So whereas a network interface card, can, you can connect an antenna or a cable to it, the wireless adapter already comes with the feature of an antenna to send it wirelessly. Now, most modern computers, you can do kind of both. It comes with a network interface card where you can plug in a cable and it comes with a wireless adapter so that you can uh, send and receive information via Wi-Fi. And this is great so that you can switch out depending on your needs. So if you want to stream a game that you're playing, for example, you might want an Ethernet cable because it's more reliable and it can handle bigger amounts of data uh, at once and it's more effective. Whereas if you want something that's portable, easy to move around, and it's not really that uh, um, labor intensive, that's not, not too big a quantities, then a wireless uh, connection is really great. So, routers and modems. I didn't understand the difference for a really long time, but essentially, a router is what connects devices in a local area and makes them into a network, and then it connects that network to the internet, the biggest network of all. So the router is the gateway between your house, your, your local uh, uh, area network, your little lawn, and the rest of the world, really. So it manages the communication between your own devices and between your devices and the rest of the internet. So when there's information traveling from your computer to somewhere out on the internet, the router is the thing that says, hey, information, take this path to go where you're supposed to go. And it's also what protects really your devices from the rest of the internet and has, for example, firewalls that make sure that nothing that isn't supposed to get into your local area network gets in and can harm your computer or your devices. So the modem is between the router and the rest of the internet. You usually plug in your router into the modem, right? So it goes router, modem, internet. So the modem then, what does that do? The modem connects your network via the router to an internet service provider. So using communication lines, usually through a phone jack, for example, telephone jack. So that the internet service provider is the thing that allows you to have internet access. So the modem's job then is to connect the router and the internet service provider. The rest of the important hardware is stuff you're probably very familiar with. Mice, keyboards, screens, uh, speakers, microphones, everything that you need to give input to the computer, such as the keyboard and mouse clicks and stuff like that, but also stuff that the, communi the co computer communicates to you. So the screen, sounds, information, etc. These are called usually peripherals or input-output devices. Um, and they're, they also connect to the motherboard where everything is connected together. They get managed just like everything else really by the motherboard and works together with the rest of the hardware to, uh, to, to um, works together with the rest of the hardware uh, so that you can have, you can use your computer. So what then counts as software or what is software? So it's all of the programs, all of the instructions and code that runs on your computer, that runs on your hardware. So usually you can categorize software into two really, really broad uh, categories. And that is 
system software and application software. So the system software is everything that the computer needs to run and be usable and um, serve as uh, a baseline for you to work from. It's all the stuff that's necessary to just get the, get the computer to function. So the main component of that uh, system software, so that you can understand what I mean, is the operating system. So the operating system is an intermediary between you, the user, and the hardware. It makes it possible for you to not think about the processes, everything the computer needs to be able to just run, so that you can focus on using the software that you want to use for, for specific needs and functionality. So it provides a platform for uh, other software to work from. Now, in computer science, you'll meet these terms that are very general platform framework that once you get into it a little bit more, you will understand. But for now, the word platform doesn't really say much for you. And that's why I'm trying to explain what it actually does. So the operating system, when you uh, start up a, a processor, a game, an application, what, Spotify, whatever, um, the operating system is the baseline and all of the programs that you want to use as the user works on top of the software, uh, of the op operating system, sorry. Um, without the operating system, you wouldn't be able to use your computer. You wouldn't be able to install um, Epic Games or, or Spotify. It works so that um, the hardware does what it does. You don't have to think about that and you can just use the stuff that you, you the programs you want to use. And that is really what the word platform means in this case. It's the springboard for all the other software that you want to use. So this, uh, the operating system contains um, utility, programs, tools that helps the uh, operating system manage the hardware, the system resources, tell the CPU what to do, tell, tell the RAM what to store, what to do, etc. And gets all of these to work together on the software level so that they, in turn, can direct it to the hardware level. Now, application software is something that maybe you're more uh, familiar with practically. It's all of the programs that are developed for users that um, manage specific tasks. So Spotify is an application software for listening and streaming music, listening to and streaming music. Um, Word is a application software for word uh, processing. Um, and so on and so forth. So it has nothing to do with managing the computer resources and, and talking to the hardware and just making sure that the computer runs and functions. It has to do with you as the user wanting to do something specific and a program or, or uh, a piece of code or software um, that is specialized for your own needs. So that is application software. So going into operating systems in a bit more detail, what do they actually do? So they manage and coordinate the resources of the computer um, and make sure that the hardware does what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. So it makes sure that different processes run uh, at the correct times and in correct order and that they don't um, clash with each other so that if you're writing to disk, meaning that you're saving something or you're um, retrieving something from your hard drive, uh, meaning that you're loading something, that those two things don't happen at the same time so that something goes wrong. So it schedules specific uh, things that you're, you want to do or that the system needs to do in order so they don't clash. Another thing it does is it manages your file system. So it makes sure that your files are saved according to the standards that your computer, your specific computer, adheres to. Another thing it does is it contains um, 
I mean, the operating system is a whole suite of different things. And one thing it contains is the kernel, which we'll talk about in a minute, and something called system libraries. Now, libraries uh, or packages, you'll come across this as well a lot. And again, it is a general term that has a lot of different meanings depending on the context in which it, it's used. So libraries and packages are its code that's bundled together for a specific purpose. It's not necessarily a program, but it's code in one file in one place that you download and it can accomplish a specific task. So system library, system libraries um, are small, small um, um, packages, small, small, uh, small, small, um, like code that puts together. Think of it as a Word document and you just have written a bunch of um, lines of code and then you save that as a file. And that could be how you can think of as, uh, how you can think of libraries and packages. And your computer uses these different system um, uh, libraries in order to be able to, um, for example, make sure that you saved to disk or make sure that um, something runs properly. Um, so it's bundles of code that does specific things. That is a package or a library, really. The software, ha uh, the oper operating system has um, utilities, which again, very broad category, but um, basically the same things as uh, libraries and packages, bundles of code that does specific stuff um, that helps everything run, um, that makes sure that you can um, have input and output so that when you type on your keyboard, it actually manages to um, capture and process what you are doing on your keyboard or when you're double clicking your mouse, there are tools, utilities, packages that make sure that what is supposed to happen when you double click on an icon actually does happen. It also provides the UI, so the visual um, representation of um, everything on your computer. Because really all a computer is, is a bunch of line of text. So when you move your mouse around, that is for your benefit to visually understand what's happening. That's not how the computer actually processes things. You could completely um, ignore uh, icons. You, you, could, you don't even need to use a mouse. You could have a black screen and type in text and you could use uh, your computer that way. But it's not very intuitive. It um, doesn't show you an overview of what your computer contains. So that's why UIs were really invented and what, that's what made computers so easy to use for the general public. Because typing in a command, clicking enter, sorry, that's my cat. That was also my cat, if you could hear that tipper tapping. Um, it, it's not really very intuitive and you don't really always remember what you have where and stuff like that. So having the UI makes sure that you can visually see a lot of information at once that using a black screen and typing in text doesn't allow you to do in the same way. And the operating system is what makes the UI the visual look, the double clicking instead of typing in a command, clicking enter and directing the computer to open that folder, for example. The, UI, the operating system provides the UI that allows you to do that. So we said that the operating system contains the kernel. Um, and this is something that people will use and kind of just mention briefly. And it's a little bit of a magical black box thing. The kernel, it has a Unix kernel, Linux kernel, whatever. So let's really try to understand what the kernel is so that you can take that knowledge with you. So 
the kernel is the core, the very, the very essence of the operating system. I know we're using a lot of general terms, but bear with me. So if you imagine the operating system in layers where the very, like an onion, so if the very, very center part of that is the hardware, that is what actually does all the processing, actually makes everything happen. So the kernel is the layer of the operating system that lies closest to the hardware. That is the most center piece of the operating system that sort of envelops the hardware, if you, if you will. So the kernel is the part of the operating system that actually tells the hardware what to do. So the operating system does that, but the part of the operating system that does that is the kernel. So it directs the hardware and is sort of the, the bridge between the rest of the operating system and the hardware. So it makes sure that um, the most basic and fundamental pieces of uh, the computer functions and runs. It is the essence. So uh, an operating system can't run without a kernel, but a kernel can run. I mean, it's not fun. You can't really do anything, but it can exist without the rest of the operating system. So whenever you think of uh, allocating resources for the computer, telling the processor what to do, what to focus on, um, managing memory and storage to disk and um, using uh, apps and processes to make sure that you even have a framework to work from, a platform to uh, have as a springboard, the kernel is what makes sure that all of that works and happens. Um, when you're gonna start um, virtualizing computers, meaning that you fake a computer inside of another computer, really cool. Um, you can use your own computer's kernel so that you can um, save memory and save uh, processing power. So you don't have to fake too completely new uh, or you don't have to uh, use your computer's resources to have your operating system that you use. And then inside of that operating system, your fake computer. So if this part, the virtualization, the fake computer you just created virtually in your, com in your own computer, if they use the same kernel, then you save some processing power and some um, space on your computer. So the kernel really is the crucial part, the most important part, the, the central layer of the operating system. So let's go through some different operating systems. So one operating system you're gonna hear a lot about, but probably never use, is called Unix. Now, Unix was developed in the 1970s at Bell Labs. And I mean, it's not used a lot today, but uh, the way it designed its operating system was so influential that its um, design principles or how it's structured is still used today. So for example, one thing that it, that's my cat playing. Uh, one thing that it introduced was uh, being able to have multiple users. So if you log in as you and I log in as Elena, then you will have different settings than me. Um, you will have different files stored than the files I store, and I can't access your files and you can't access my files. So Unix was the one that thought of that idea to, to begin with. And it also had this idea of permissions, meaning that for certain files, I get to save it or I get to open it, write something in it or change it, and save it uh, as a different version. And that is called writing to a file. And sometimes if it's an important file or something that's necessary for, this, for the system to even work, you might not have permission to change it so that you don't mess up your, your computer. 
Um, so the whole idea of permission is to make sure that the right people who are supposed to be able to see or change a file are able to. Before this, anyone could do anything to any file. Not great if you don't know what you're doing and you accidentally change one letter and your computer crashes because the operating system now doesn't work. So by, using, by introducing permissions, not only could you safeguard your own personal files, you could make sure that users who weren't really used to managing the system files or managing the very, very basic um, files in order for the operating system to run, that they didn't accidentally do something wrong. Another thing it introduced was this idea of a, a hierarchical, hierarchical, a hierarchy within your file system. So if you ever got into your computer, you might see that you have a drive that's called, um, I use Windows, so I'm gonna use a lot of Windows examples, sorry, Mac users, um, C colon. So you start off with that and everything else is under that, right? So that is the tree structure. You start with C and then you double click and you open it and you see a bunch of stuff and then you double click something else and you open that and then again you see a bunch of stuff. So if you would visualize that, it would look like kind of like a family tree. It would start at one point up here and then it would kind of branch out like that. And this way of storing systems is, uh, it was Unix that introduced this way of storing, uh, storing um, sorry, of this way of storing um, files, this file system storage. Unix was, was really what um, started that. And that's still true today. So if you would go into your computer, you would also see this kind of hierarchy, this tree structure of your files and folders. So and the next operating system that you should be aware of is called Linux. Now, Linux, Unix, yes, they are sort of related. So. Linux is very much based off of Unix. Uh, it's open source, so that means that anyone can look at the code and um, well, view the code, add to the code, uh, and it has a big community that um, helps develop it. But what's great about Linux is that it's used a lot on servers. So when you are programming a server, which you will do, um, you use Linux to um, store all the code you need to be able to uh, start and manage a server. And the reason this is great is that it's really um, universal. You can use it on um, any platform that allows you to house code, for, a, um, for example, for a web page. So, you have these platforms such as AVS, uh, AWS, um, which is Amazon, um, and you have uh, uh, Microsoft has its own and so on and so forth. So these are platforms that uh, say, hey, you can use our computers and you can uh, transfer your code onto our computers and then you can give people a URL and then they can use your code. So when you do that, when you transfer your code, it needs to have an operating system to function within. It is the platform, right? So what's great about Linux is that you can have it on pretty much any uh, AWS, you can have it on any Microsoft, you can have it on any, any provider for that service, really. If you've ever heard of the cloud, the cloud, is just a room with a bunch of computers somewhere else. That is the cloud. Um, and those computers um, house a website, the code for a website. So those computers need an operating system to function. And then the code that you place there to, ac to have uh, your website needs an operating system as a platform. And Linux usually is that operating system. So it's very universal. You can put it on almost um, any type of uh, hardware, any type of platform, and it will run the same. Um, and it's also used something for embedded systems. Now, embedded systems is um, 
for example, smart TVs, or um, if you have a, let's say, uh, AC at home that automatically measures your temperature. So you'll have a little, little microchip, a teeny tiny computer that has a sensor attached to it. The sensor will um, buy this teeny tiny computer um, have uh, make sure to measure the temperature say once every minute to make sure that it's stable so the teeny tiny computer microchip has code on it that says hey sensor check what the temperature is and you do that once a minute the sensor sends back that data and this teeny tiny microchip sends that data onwards to somewhere else and manages the temperature in your house the operating system that this teeny tiny computer has, the little microchip, most likely Linux, almost 90% Linux. So it works for um, storing, having being the baseline for um, uh, websites, and it works for being the baseline in computers that are this small. And that's the great thing about uh, Unix really, like no matter what code you're developing, you can put it on anything and it, you can expect the same operating system and the same results across the board. So it's very useful and um, it's, it's going to be something that you're going to have to get familiar with really. So let's talk a little bit about macOS. Now macOS is actually based on Unix as well. So it has the same structure, the same ideas and if you go into the terminal or command line interface or for you to visualize this really uh, that part in a movie where somebody has a black screen and types text presses enter and the computer answers with more text whenever you go into that it works the same way as linux so one thing about mac uh, Mac OS is that it is specifically designed to work with Mac hardware, with Apple hardware. So this is great because it is optimized. It is specially designed. That means that it's going to run faster, smoother, easier, and it's going to be people who know the hardware and they're going to make uh, an operating system that is designed specifically for that. Sort of like if you had a game console um, people who work on the game console and the code for that, they're going to make sure that the game console can run higher graphics and just be more better and more optimized because it's so because they know it so well. Whereas a general purpose uh, machine such as Windows, for example, that doesn't specialize its operating system towards a specific hardware, it might have some some kinks sometimes, right? But this also means that um, macOS is very secure because it's what you would call a closed um, eco structure that you can't use a non-Mac application on a Mac computer really, or you need to download the Mac version. It's always going to be a little bit close, so it's always more difficult to introduce security risks to this. The downside of Mac is that you really need a Mac computer to develop um, code for other Mac computers and Mac OS. Uh, you can't have a Windows computer and code for uh, a Mac, uh, really. Um, you can fake a Windows computer in your Mac computer. Like we talked earlier about virtualization, which is just you tell your computer, hey, pretend that there's another computer here. So you have your computer and inside like a Russian doll, you have another fake computer. So you can do a fake Windows in a Mac but you can't do a fake Mac in a Windows. And that is because um, Apple has such a closed, guarded architecture. So what about Windows then? Well, Windows is another operating system and it's developed by Microsoft. So the differences here is that 
if Mac is made, if Mac operating system is made for Apple slash Mac hardware, Windows is coded so that you can use the same operating system on a bunch of different machines. So it's not really specialized to a specific type of hardware the way, the way that Mac OS is. So this is really great for accessibility and there's a really big um, like eco, um, eco system, that's the word, ecosystem of different applications and programs and things you can download and things you can do. Um, you have lots of people who, who code for it, who, who develop these small, small programs, who can release it and you as a user can try things out, download it, and it's not really so guarded. So it's great for accessibility, usually a little bit cheaper, and it democratizes um, the market a bit in that sense, right? But the problem has been historically then that it's not as secure. Since they're not guarding it so closely, and they need to be open to lots of different um, hardware and lots of different applications in that sense, it's easier to introduce um, security risks and it's easier to, um, for example, have a third party, you install something on your Windows computer and it has a virus on it. With Mac, they control that stuff really carefully and with Windows, it's a lot more open. So there's a lot more variety but it's also a little bit more risky. Now they've gotten really good at it lately, but it's just never, ever, ever going to be as good if you have somebody who says you can't touch my hardware and you cannot release anything from my computer unless I have a say so, um, no matter how much you guard the Windows um, operating system. So that is something to think about, but again, they've gotten really good at it, so it's not a, a, as big of a problem as it has been, and it's, it's, it's quite good anyway. So as a programmer, what should you be thinking about when choosing operating system or buying a computer or, or, or what have you? One thing is that with Linux, you can install a, a Linux operating system or something that, was, that will help you work in a Linux operating system type of um, environment or the same type of principles, the same, co the same code uh, on both Mac and Windows. So mm -hmm. Linux will be available no matter really what you choose. Now, if you choose to have a Mac and code in Mac, you will be able to fake a Windows computer. So you will be able to code for both Mac and Windows. If you choose a Windows computer, you will not be able to virtualize, you won't be able to fake a Mac OS environment, you won't be able to fake the Mac OS in your Windows. There are programs that help you write code that will run for Mac, but you won't be able to actually finalize and create the software for Mac. Uh, we will talk about this in another video something called git bash that uses the same um, commands and the same code as Mac. So you can still use the same instructions, but you won't be able to finalize and create the software in a Windows for a Mac. So you need to buy a Mac to be able to do that. Another advantage of Linux, Mac, that sort of symbiosis there is they're very similar and they do use the same commands. So if you work with a Mac computer, you have the same commands um, in uh, Linux. Whereas in Windows, you won't have the same commands. Now you can download programs and applications so that you can use and store the same commands so they can be applied to Linux and Mac. But all this really means is if you have a Windows computer, you need to download some extra stuff to be able to work for Mac and, uh, and Linux. The only difference really is that you won't be able to finalize and build, meaning you won't be able to take the code and tell the computer, hey, create a program out of this code uh, for Mac OS if you have a Windows. That's really the only difference. This isn't very relevant for um, web programming. It's only really relevant if you're specifically, specifically creating 
applications uh, for uh, macOS or for iPhones. Um, so it's not, it's a specialized case when you need have to have a Mac computer. Usually it's totally fine to have either. So it all depends on your needs, but for now you will be completely fine with either. So what are the key, key things that you should take with you today? A computer is an electronic device that performs instructions. Um, you have hardware and you have software. Hardware, the stuff you can throw out of a window. Software, the stuff that runs on hardware. Uh, you have a bunch of different hardware that works together to make sure that everything works. You have the brain, the CPU. You have the graphics card with the GPU in it or on it. Uh, and that renders images and makes sure that you can play games, watch videos, look at pictures. You have um, the hard drive that stores long-term memory and you have RAM, which is your computer's short-term memory. And your CPU uses that to, uh, as a workspace. It loads up the processes and the data it needs to do the things that the system needs to be doing now and the things that you are doing now. You have um, the motherboard, which is like a Lego plate that connects all of the other hardware together. So if the motherboard is the Lego plate, uh, the other hardware that I've mentioned so far are like Lego pieces that attach to that Lego plate. You have uh, input output devices, which is anything and everything uh, you need to communicate with your computer and everything your computer has to communicate with you. So that are sc that's screens, that's um, speakers, mice, keyboards, microphones, you name it. Anything that gives information between you and computers, that's input output devices. And you have some stuff that allows you to go online and um, or for networking, but that is essentially going online. So you have a um, network interface uh, card on your computer. That thing remakes data so that it's sendable to your router. The, uh, in there you have um, either ways of sending it with an ethernet cable, which is a physical cable that you connect between your computer and your router, or it has uh, an antenna for Wi-Fi. You can also have a wireless adapter, which is the same thing as a, as a network interface card, but it comes with the antenna already there so that it just transmits it via, via Wi-Fi straight away. You have the router, which links all of your devices uh, in your house, for example, a local area network, a LAN, and it connects your devices, your geographical area, your LAN, to the rest of the internet. It is also a gateway between your LAN and the rest of the internet, and it makes sure that um, information goes where it's supposed to go, and it makes sure that bad stuff doesn't come into your local area network, that um, there are firewalls that protect your local area network. Then you have the modem, which sits between the router and the internet service provider. And the modem makes sure that, it's, uh, that, that the information gets transmitted in the correct way, in the format that can be transmitted across the internet. Software are the programs and the instructions that run on your hardware. You can categorize it into two broad categories, system software and application software. System software, the most important part there, is the operating system. The operating system is what makes sure that the hardware and all of um, the processes that your computer needs to do to just be at a baseline works. It is a springboard uh, for for all of the stuff that you as the user want to do 
application software is all the stuff you as a user want to do. It's all the Spotify, the games, the word processor, the calculator, uh, what have you. Anything that is specialized that you want to use. The operating system, make sure to manage resources, memory, uh, saving files, storing files, make sure that things happen in a, the correct order, that nothing happens at the same time and that it clashes and crashes. Um, and it's a whole suite, a whole whole network of different programs. It has um, tools that makes all of this happen, but it also has the kernel. So the kernel is the layer of the operating system that is closest closest to the hardware it is if you imagine it as an onion and this is the uh, hardware the kernel is the thing that sits closest like this and the rest of the operating system envelops on top of that there are different operating systems but a lot of them function or are inspired by unix that was um, invented in the 1970s. They, Unix was the operating system that um, um, introduced having multiple users, that introduced uh, stuff like multitasking, that introduced um, the file structure, the, hi uh, the tree branching hierarchical, hierarchical, whichever um, file structure that we see and use today. Um, and it was the thing, the operating system that introduced permissions so that um, people who are authorized, that are allowed to view or change files, are only doing that to the, to the things that they are entitled to do and to protect certain things so that people don't accidentally um, delete things that are important. So from Unix uh, sprung Linux which is a very, uh, very much inspired by Unix. You can use it on servers, you can use it on embedded systems, these tiny microchips. And the reason it's so great is because you can download it for both Windows and Mac. You can use it to store your code. And then when you want to transfer your code somewhere else, it's going to behave the exact same way as when you used it. You have Mac OS, which is great because it has a lot of tight architecture. So the hardware and the operating system are really, really connected. The people who work with uh, Mac OS know the Apple um, hardware. So they're gonna make sure that it runs even smoother and specialize their code to make sure that it's faster, but it's also very secure because they don't allow anything from the outside to come in. Windows is really great because it is uh, made for lots and lots of different devices. It makes sure that there's lots of people that can contribute with different types of software, with four different types of devices, for different types of hardware. And what's not so great about that is that it can pose more of a security risk than closed architecture. They've gotten better. It's just never ever going to be as good as if you have a, a gatekeeper that says, no, we have to inspect every single thing that you want to be able to use on our hardware. Uh, that doesn't mean that it isn't very good and hasn't gotten a lot of better uh, in recent years. So the last summarizing is what do you need to know as a programmer when you're choosing uh, an operating system? really only is if you want to use if you want to make apps and programs for mac then you have to have a mac computer otherwise it doesn't really matter because you can fake a windows computer in your mac computer and you can write code that is like mac os on your windows the only thing you can't do on windows is you can't finalize and package your uh, Mac OS program so that you can just run it on a Mac uh, on a on an Apple computer or or an iPhone. Um, these are specialized niche cases and for most programmers you won't have to have uh, a Mac computer uh, and it's not essential to your work. The only time it's essential is if you develop apps or programs for specifically Apple computers or iPhones. Otherwise, you're kind of good to go no matter what you do. And you will need to learn Linux because when you're going to create servers, 
that is the operating system you will be using and you can use that on both Mac and Windows. So it's all good. So thanks for listening today. I hope you learned a lot uh, and that it wasn't too confusing and that is going to help you moving forward um, when you uh, in your programming journey and having a bit more understanding about the the uh, underlying structures, the underlying principles, when people just throw out the word kernel, you'll at least have heard the word before. So that's what I'm hoping you take with you today. So thanks a lot and I'll see you in the next video.